causing considerable difficulties for the enemy in this in this area. The uh, friendly activities uh, are going according to the plan here. General Tree is a bit upset because all he interests seems to be in the ocean affair, and he's a rather powerful general. I was briefed by him by General Tim, the 25th Division Commander. Uh, they worked out all of these plans themselves. And uh, the ocean operation kicked off at the same time. And uh, uh, he's been complaining the last few days that uh, no one's paying much, very much attention to him. And he's operating way over in these animals. And uh, he feels he's doing a remarkable job, Mr. President. And, uh, it's all South Vietnamese uh, operated, and uh, so we have a little ground problem with him, but I think we can probably take care of that in the next 24 hours. We have a little different feelings, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be taken care of. But this operation is uh, it's a successful operation, and we'll have a great deal to do with maintaining the uh, stability uh, uh, and giving the employees an opportunity to.
far as their air power is concerned, we're ahead of schedule on phase two of the minimization program. We're 15 of our doctors ahead of schedule. We're the worst fee under the program that we worked out, making over 500 uh, helicopters in their oral inventory. We're also ahead of schedule in fixed clean aircraft as of this day. And the only factor is the main factor there is the training facilities. But here are moving forward on okay. The program, as far as soon as is complements to the field program negotiations. Uh, I think uh, it's working well. And it still is a dual program, dual track program, as far as Vietnam is concerned. The organization does actually complement to the negotiation abroad. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I try to avoid statistics, forecasts, or predictions. I don't think this is the year necessarily to get into forecasts and predictions uh, uh, as far as uh, Vietnam is concerned. We may have to do some of that uh, next year. I think the manner in which we uh, handle the public affairs of the ocean operation is very good. We've judged the minimum of U.S. involvement. Most of the announcements have been made by the South Vietnamese. I think it has truly been identified as a South Vietnamese operation. And this was most important. Not only important from the standpoint of the U.S. public, but important from the standpoint of continuing to build this important confidence, which is needed and necessary as far as uh, the South Vietnamese forces. This operation is justified in accordance with the uh, limitation which was recommended in the Congressional Appropriation Act, known as the Senate's main amendment, and that uh, this truly qualifies in all respects under that Virginia Amendment of making possible further withdrawals of Americans from South Vietnam and to protect the lives of Americans as these withdrawals go forward. Those are the two major points which were placed in the Congressional limitation against the use of ground forces and against the use of American forces in Laos and Cambodia. We are not only following the letter of the law, we are following the intent of the law and the sponsors of this legislation. This was uh, as well as almost every other person in the Congress of the United States, in both the Senate and the House, realize that we are following uh, this mandate of the Congress and respect the mandate of the Congress. There are other side benefits that are important from these operations, and perhaps the most important of which is that we are giving the Cambodians some time to build this military force which has grown from 30,000 to 218,000 for a period of six months. Our military assistance program was not approved until December. We've only had two months, really, to operate under that military assistance program. And although we cannot publicly justify the operations that are going on uh, in Cambodia or Laos on this basis, we, uh, we do have this uh, ancillary uh, benefit that I think uh, is important uh, as we move from 1971 to 1972. But, uh, Mr. President, I think the operations are going well. Uh, I could go on at some point. Mr. Eisenhower, I think that what Mel said is a particular question I had Captain Moss is almost an understatement. I think it's one of the best coordinated plan uh, operations I've uh, ever seen in Washington. And I think we forget how much uh, the president has become actively involved in these things. For example, he has measures for multiple leaders and it's not a very well planned orchestrated uh, scenario for diplomatic presentations. We touched this with all the senators and congressmen. People in Congress, and so that I think it's been extremely well thought through operation. Um, because a lot of you are going to be questioned about it, there are two or three things we should mention. One, obviously, there are going to be some known sets of problems in the future, but the high problems that we didn't anticipate, for example, when Bill says we've lost 25 milligrams.
six a day anyway in that area. I mean, in that general area, what we've done is transfer most of the helicopters to Laos, send those that we use to check on operations. So, consequently, we do have some losses, but they're not so exactly high, and they're not more than we expected. Uh, I think that when we talk about northern Laos, you should keep in mind that's an that's ongoing fight that's been going on for five or six years, so there's nothing new about that. Really, what we're talking about is it's a panhandle, it's a southern fight in Laos. And if that succeeds, and as Bell said, it looks like it's going to, then it's going to, it's going to, it's going to be a major blow to him. Not only now, but we can see it will be Now, we don't want to try it too much because we don't want to make people think this is going to end the war if it's successful. But it's certainly going to have a crippling effect on the enemy if it's successful and it has a, it shows every side of being successful. I think in the discussions we have outside, though, we should keep in mind that we want to maintain the maximum flexibility so that if, if we wanted to get out a little earlier, we could, or if we want to stay a little longer, we can. Now, fortunately, we have emphasized two facts. One, not enlarging the war in the sense of some new area. This area in southern Laos has been, it's been the scene of, of combat, active combat since 1965. We've been bombing this area very severely since 65. So it's not a new area of combat. The only thing I knew about it is the South Vietnamese are going in on the ground. Because the bombings have not been successful. That's the only new fact is not enlarging at all. Secondly, when we talk about Japan being a major population center, keep in mind that really there's practically nobody there. It's a deserted town. If you look at the pictures, you can't find any people, and there would only be 2,000 to begin with, and I think they're all gone, so we're really not talking about an area where there are any people. And if there are people that are not by ocean civilians, they're in the Panama or the North Korean East. We want to maintain the flexibility of, of time. And the way to do that is to say it's limited in time and area. When people say, what's your time limitation? Then you say, it depends on the weather. Sometimes the rainy season starts in the middle of April. Sometimes it doesn't start in June. So we want to, we don't want to start talking about we'll get out by May 1st or we what we're saying in May 1st. We might want to get out in the 15th. So it seems to me we should leave that alone. We don't, we don't place it there. Say so the limited operation is limited by the weather. The operation in the South Vietnamese military. I want to make it up. Uh, I, I don't say it would be possible to manage an operation that's been more successful than this today, both diplomatically, politically at home with young people, or militarily. And uh, it's one of those things that should be quite a great deal of planning by the president's point. It worked out well, and I think that we all talk to those terrorists that will talk to you. Question, what do we say about Long Nose illness? Well, I think we just say that we, you know, obviously, what we cover is we don't think it's going to be a serious low, obviously, it's low, but it's got good people, good young people, and I think the most important thing to emphasize is what we quote is a deeply unified. It's not at all the way it was in South Vietnam, where there was a division. Everybody supports the government, young people, intellectuals, the Buddhist monks. The whole country supports the government. And they weren't all that attached to Ron Gall, who was a good leader and has a little more military stature than the student attack. We think the student attack is going to be good, and Ron Gall might as we say that we hope he'll be good. He's young. Mr. President, the other question that uh, I'm going to put this in that way, uh, well, what would happen? Uh, possibly the Red Chinese come in and pray with all of our actions in China. Well, I think there's something to do with it. If we miss that one, we don't think they will. They didn't last time. The fighting, you see, this is a long way to the northern front of us where we're fighting. Fighting on northern front is not new at all.
don't want to get into a position where we set some objective way out, like the happens on the mobile walk, and then the headlines and all the papers and everything are the uh, walk up there because it uh, was not accomplished. We're accomplishing something every day in this operation. And uh, we don't want to limit it into the area more at the time. It's most important that we, we uh, follow that in all of our discussions. So, can I ask Mel a, a question about uh, the uh, training of the uh, helicopter pilots and training over that kind of operation to uh, South Vietnam? What's holding that up and, and what, what restrictions do you want that? There are no restrictions on it. As a matter of fact, we all have appreciated uh, first, present to a general panel, not want to reconstitute every division of South Vietnam in the image of American divisions because they want their divisions except for two major divisions to be located in the areas that they're going to defend so that they'll be living here in their homes and can be involved in the, the protection of their particular uh, area, their particular area of the country, whether it's in the military region one, two, three, or four. So they will not have as many helicopters as the United States. They already have more helicopters than any free world nation, except the United States. They are operating 550 helicopters at the present time. There's no free world nation. There's no free world nation in any place in the world that has this many. We turned over 325 this year, training the crews, the maintenance, the mechanics, set up the maintenance traps. They're running them. Now, we are going to be turning over some more, but we're not going to kill the South Vietnamese forces in the image of the United States Army because that kind of mobility within their country is going to be that they're going to get two or more divisions. They're going to be completely equipped by the United States division as far as their mobility is concerned. So we're not going to do that with every one of their divisions. So it makes sense. Thank you. 
draw from Vietnam, not to draw in a way. And the uh, South Vietnamese would have no chance to survive and to make their own decision with regard to their future. But to draw in a way the South Vietnam and bring an independent country able to determine its own future without having to impose by military force or another. We are accomplishing that objective. And we are accomplishing the withdrawal of your Congress and accomplishing the reduction of the American involvement in a very, actually, spectacular way. But you put it another way. The casualties in the month of January this year I looked at them and I compared them with the last month of the previous administration. They were five times as great as that as they were in the month of January this year. That's some progress. The number of troops that we will have in Vietnam on May 1st will be approximately one half of what they were in the beginning. And of course, that program of withdrawal and replacement will continue. And finally, South Vietnamese are able at this time more and more they have our developing capability as we withdraw to defend ourselves. If we accomplish this, it will be a major accomplishment because we have done so. Uh, with very, very strong opposition politically, particularly uh, in the Senate. Uh, we have done it without any, any or hardly any support from the so-called American establishment. Uh, we understand that lack of support because they believe uh, either that we should have gone to Vietnam in the first place, many can argue that, and second, once we got there, many believe it was conducting the wrong way. But given what we found, what we're doing, what we are going to be judged about is how we, how we came on. The easy thing would have been just to get out. The easy thing would have been not to do the campaign and have suffered a quite a disastrous situation this year as Cambodia was rolled up by the North Vietnamese sanctuaries were extended and the whole southern parts of Vietnam would become. Therefore, uh, subject to attack, and the Americans there would have had to withdraw and pursue it. Uh, not to have done Laos, no problem this year. <clears throat> but as we wind out our forces to a minimum next year, a very serious problem. Because as our withdrawal program becomes more and more successful, the danger to our remaining forces, forces becomes greater and greater by almost geometric proportions. And for that reason, after a lot of soul searching, because it's so much easier to say, gee, stay through this year, things are going good. Casualties aren't going to go up and do it. But my analysis, we, if they took the action in Cambodia, we've taken the action in Laos, not to expand the war, because Hanoi had already expanded the war in the Cambodia and in the Laos. But for the purpose of bringing the American involvement in the war to an end. Uh, this is our goal. It may not work. If it doesn't, then we have to take the responsibility. But if it does, we can look back and recognize it that it did work because of what these, these things that happened. These are the things that we have to keep in mind. And uh, we're not all psychoed about it. In this kind of a situation where we are not allowed to use all of our power, it's so easy we could uh, it would be a um, study uh, in this kind of situation. We, we, uh, we simply can't look at this we traditionally have in the context of sanctions and engagement. But considering the limitations on what we are able to do, considering the long hangers the country is on the road, considering the vision of all, uh, this administration has taken a very, very hard problem and trying to resolve it in a way that we can continue to have a viable foreign policy moment in the world. We think we are going to be able to do it. Next year, we'll know. Uh, what we're doing this year is to make sure, as sure as we can, to find some insurance, not to sure, but to find some insurance next year, we can look back and say that we were able to accomplish a goal that many thought was impossible to be had. On the health program, Elliot is uh, going to make his presentation briefly and have his uh, colleagues continue. Uh, I have 
heard it four times now, so I, uh, I don't want to uh, have Elliot feel that he has to change his lines because I heard them before. So I've got to have a vice president preside on this part of it because and also he's heard it four times too. And he'll preside and be sure that Elliot calls and that uh, uh,
courses is up on our last trial tech set. The answer trade is in the health planning and program development every day to take over. Let's start that what is it's the first slide of a series of slides that are in design. But for the use of all of us who will be talking to people on the hill and I've left out some of these slides. Some are still to be angered with in one way or another because the numbers are wrong or because you misread it or something. So give you a general idea. The, uh, the partnership approach that we are imposing that size landing change to reach desired goals. No radical restructuring where restructuring is not necessary. It's what it's just said. What we have tried to do is zero in on what was wrong, being careful not to destroy more than we propose to construct. We are emphasizing also choice, not compulsion. This is a comprehensive approach in the sense that it is emphasizing not just the quantity of medical care, but its quality. It emphasizes the development of the supply of medical care, and it's not simply a response to that. And it uh, focuses on approaches which are parts of a group recognizes that we require a belongs to a total system. I won't go through this uh, line by line. These are statistics showing that on the whole we're a lot better off than we were at the turn of the century. One of the most dramatic figures, especially since we hear a lot about the relative position of the United States in the federal trial is that in 1920, there were one in 150 maternal deaths in childbirth. Today, it's one in 4,000. So that's uh, looked at in the aggregate over time. We look pretty good. But the, uh, there are comparatively disturbing aspects of the relative position of the United States. You see life expectancy on the left. And uh, on the right, so I said, seven my expectations. Read the job. You know, I don't get a call, and I'm trying to do some other things because of the reporting. Well, it's that uh, the reporting system for those countries is not the same kind of system that we have, and you just get in all kinds of trouble with those figures. I'm not sure that's true. So I guarantee you that's true. I've been saying that for years. I mean, she does the appropriation subcommittee in the system. is entirely different. Well, we can have to assume that we're in there that the you'll be able to deploy international parity of data. And our relationship is the system is different. Every world has a world health organization. We just agree to get the definitions. Agree upon it. Don't have a life expectancy to be able to get out of the trees to get out of the energy. The percentage of the energy that's on the front end. So the life expectancy to be able to get out of the trees to get out of the trees. Oh, I can see you after class. You can have a lot of trees. There's something lower than the average male. Turning then to one of several charts uh, on specific problems within the total picture. Here is a chart showing the relatively higher ratio of disability days for low income people. The, uh, and the comparison of mortality between whites and non whites. Of course, one of the factors passing problems now is the comparability of U.S. figures with the rest of the world is that the relative position of the U.S. is uh, most poor because of the very much poor comparable place of the mortality. Other, uh, I had a, you know, I had a, 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 I had a
program rather than a radical structure without regard to where the options are. We have the charts that we can skip for now and each of these five problems laying out what they are. But I'd like to go to uh, the to basic principles. These two are, so I draw up some extent of the emerging message and we're summarized by the secretary and the president of the other. We've said before about complete replacement, not being just obviously what we have in mind here. We raise questions about certain nationalized and compulsory health insurance plans that are proposed to uh, completely and radically restructure all private health insurance and the medical uh, care system. Second, we we can try to reinforce the point that the UNRDMP figures and others that you've seen probably is not so much more money. The problem is how the delivery system. How are you spent? That we must have a comprehensive policy. And again, here we think the we propose national health partnership is far more comprehensive and extensive in terms of the problems it addresses than any other pension measure on the hill. Or that it must be a diverse health care system. So that uh, reflects at least two things. Opportunities for informed consumer choice. Again, a basic theme that people have to be able to choose the kind of health care delivery system, the kind of provider they want to deal with. Rather, again, as in some pending measures, being subjected to compulsions and requirements to deal with a certain kind of providers in a certain way. And we're talking about a system that tries to build incentives into a marketplace operation rather than relying on central planning, central rate regulation, and price fixing to create efficiency or create cost. And then lastly, it's a health system. It isn't a health care system. Not a health care system only. And this again is something I think the President's program will be distinctive in compared to other bills. We have to keep constantly in mind that, that what people want is to stay healthy, not merely to have better health care once you get sick. For those basic principles, we have, as I said, five parts of the presidential proposal. First, Health making organization to emphasize that all of these are pilots are somewhat still very much in the air, up in the air. Last March, the administration proposed as a method to Medicare program, giving the right of Medicare recipients, giving to Medicare recipients the right to elect membership in the so-called health maintenance organization. This is an organization that provides first comprehensive health care. That means hospital services, outpatient services, doctor visits, dramatic care, everything it takes to stay healthy when you get well unless you're sick. Its, it's most important feature is that it uh, involves a different kind of payment for financing them. It's a prepaid system with a fixed price contract and payments in advance for the year ahead rather than as we now have usual senior service system and the usual insurance system, the cost of plus kind of reimbursement on a piece of rate basis. You go to the doctor, the insurance company pays, and then the doctor charges at that point. If there's no negotiated contract in advance, so there's no challenges here in care here. And then finally, it's a very flexible mechanism. This is a particularly important point if you're dealing with interest groups. It does not, for example, involve the elimination of, of fee for service practice. Doctors can associate with medical societies and medical foundations. The society of the foundation as a whole can enter into a fixed price contract with care with enrollees. The foundation can choose to pay its members to practice in positions in it on a fee for service basis if they so choose. One example of the kind of flexibility is offered in the system. But through these kinds of mechanisms, HMO is as opposed to the present system, the internalized incentives for efficiency that aren't there now. Because providers will be dealing for the first time with a fixed contract amount paid in advance, they have certain margins within which to work. They know that their inefficiencies, their overutilization, 
my body might be reimbursed on an open end basis by the insurance company. It's like a uh, company putting a, uh, a lawyer on retainer or, uh, or getting a service contract for the year ahead of the television set as opposed to going out and paying a mechanic piece by piece. I say I'm now the other thing. If the mechanism also been spread, that the stress is preventative care, that the power he moves the provider to try to seek a help in you know, order that his, uh, his profit margin of retention under the fixed price contract is being defended. And therefore, he has, he's got a financial interest in providing all the preventative care and early diagnosis that we are trying for health reasons come to and then also for the locally here, the patient, it's a more convenient type of access to the health system. Now, of course, people are faced with the need of having their way through a network of, of first general practitioners and then referral to specialists. It's very difficult to work your way through a kind of self created comprehensive health plan. And this type of system has within it all the necessary kinds of service specialists. We propose five specific legislative actions to encourage the creation of health maintenance organizations to these pre group practice organizations. First, we will require that public insurance, in this case would be Medicare and most family health insurance plan, and private insurance, give their enrollees the option using the value of their insurance coverage for enrollment on a prepaid basis in an HMO. This is just an option, but right now the development of health maintenance organizations is inhibited by the fact that private policyholders can't have no portability as to their actuarial value. They can't take it across the plan and convert it into a prepaid uh, contract amount to be in an HMO. Second, we would provide planning grants to potential health maintenance organizations funding. The organizational and entrepreneurial skills needed to put together a comprehensive payment system for are significant. It's necessary to try and support this kind of activity, which would not otherwise be reimbursed to the, uh, the contract price or care itself. Third, Devices to further assist the HMOs during the startup period before they have sufficient enrollees, which uh, typically runs from 20 to 30,000, which enables them to break even on the delivery of care. And here we propose a, a direct loan and a loan guarantee program for financing the initial capital construction. And the startup costs, the startup costs are the operating deficits that occur really, really not more than three years under our legislation before the enrollment of potential medicine system. Fourth, because teaching hospital is the teaching of hospital associated medical schools have typically higher service costs. If they're going to get into the health maintenance organization business, we have to find a way to reimburse the pedagogical or educational component that's associated with their service delivery. We can't do that through the usual insurance reimbursement or, or service reimbursement. We would not want to pay a teaching hospital on the basic contract more than we would pay a community hospital. So we created a separate program to allow us to reimburse the, the extra costs associated with the education component of the teaching hospital. I might add that trying to get these organizations going in medical schools is particularly important in terms of communicating their, their desirability to medical students. And because teaching hospitals are typically located now in central city areas, they can't be particularly effective in dealing with the board. And then finally, to, to uh, use the supremacy clause of the Constitution to override two types of state legal barriers that can give a teacher to help maintenance organizations. At the present time, some 22 states have laws that either prevent or seriously limit the development of group practice medicine. 
laws you can trace back several decades typically and they are outmoded. We would propose rather than preempting them generally to say that when we enter into a contract with a provider, an HMR provider, well the delivery of services to federal beneficiaries, namely Medicare beneficiaries or Medicare Health Insurance Plan recipients. That contract for service under the supremacy law of the Constitution will prevail over any inconsistent state laws on the organization for practice. And uh, there's one other leading barrier with regards to physicians being able to delegate duties to allied health personnel under their direct supervision. State laws now inhibit that practice within a health maintenance organization. If the organization is to have efficiencies in the structure and delivery of service, it has to be able to use allied health professionals to properly supervise in a flexible way. So again, we would propose to permit doctors in an HMO to make such use under the direct supervision of allied health personnel as as efficiency and quality of care would dictate without regard to what might be the barriers operating for physicians in the sole direction. The summary cost data on this is the $80 million that uh, it's already down a little bit to go down further during the course of the day. Uh, but the price charge cover is the $30 million prior to the number we agreed on in the budget. <laughs> so I don't want the record to show that that went on note. Secretary says we are chronic folkers. Our second proposal is designed to address itself specifically to one of the problems that was, that was raised before, namely the problem of scarcity of service in certain geographic areas, namely rural areas and inner city poverty areas. The, the scarcity problem traces most directly to, to an unwillingness on the part of physicians and ancillary medical personnel is located in those areas. It's a manpower scarcity problem, which then triggers a facility problem, but a part of it is a manpower. And the positive feature of that, in terms of dominant problems, is not financial, it's not that doctors can't make a good dollar in the inner city poverty area they can, but they have done the Medicaid program. Rather, it has to do with, with the types of institutional supports that are available in, in these underserved areas. A lack of sophisticated medical backup and the teaching hospital, a lack of so called peer stimulation with doctors working together, a lack of cultural advantages for the family. So, with this kind of analysis of what is causing the problem in mind, we have a, a set of proposals that emphasize the creation of those institutional supports that we think will be attractive to move doctors into the areas. First, we propose a modification, a second generation modification of the neighborhood health center concept, something called family health centers. We propose the establishment of 125 of these over the next two years. We have about 100 now located in various areas of the country supported through OEO and HW. These are ambulatory care facilities that they typically do not provide hospital care. And they are located by definition in these medically underserved areas. A quick expansion of this program can, can give us a quick fix on the maldistribution problem, while other more long term answers like more doctor training, long forgiveness programs, and health maintenance organizations themselves. And painful. This we see is an important device, especially in the transition period to longer term solutions. Second, we would propose a, a further placement program, a special grant support program for health maintenance organizations that provide services in these poverty or scarcity areas. The idea here is to, is to give a grant rather than a guaranteed loan to an organization that will serve a poverty population as a further inducement to that service. Third, Congress passed last year and President signed in December the Emergency Health Personnel Act, creating a National Health Service Corps. We proposed to implement that legislation with an initial appropriation of $10 million. This permits public health service personnel, a variety of physicians, and I know, to be assigned to 
signed by the Secretary to designated scarcity areas. While we have the draft, this carries with it a draft exemption. We need some seconds of uh, this program, if you will, for doctors. And it will support the establishment of the new family health center in reaching that goal of recruiting physicians. And finally, Thinking of a proposal made by the Carnegie Commission for Higher Education and going directly to this problem of institution support, they propose to encourage teaching at medical schools and the university health science centers to develop satellites, mentioned medical education satellites, in scarcity areas with public area health education centers. Typically, this would be working through a medical school to develop education component in a community hospital in some scarcity area. This is happening to some extent now around the country, so that next type of school would have a training center for its upper classroom in primary care medicine out in a far flung community. Not only is it a useful teaching device, it's helpful in terms of our priority in trying to get more primary care medicine. But it is the kind of center for peer simulation and sophisticated health care that we hope will bring other physicians into that area. The third proposal has to do with the rather complete reform of our medical education and support system. Designed to do those two things that you see. First, to deal with the immediate problem we have, whereby over half of our 500 schools in the country are now applying this year for the so called financial distress aid. They're operating in lead, and increasingly so. This kind of, uh, of financial distress assistance is beginning to overwhelm project grant supports for the achievement of particular programmatic changes and reforms. And we're interested in. We've got to find a more active way of providing a secure financial base for medical schools so that we can go in the direction of the form. And secondly, we're interested in the expansion of positions and type of school production with targeted uh, efforts on primary care positions and positions aids. Just expanding the number of medical school graduates is not going to do the job. 80% of medical school graduates do not go into the primary care specialties of pediatrics, internal care, general practice. And the fact that the number of primary care specialists has gone down in absolute terms, even the high number of positions has gone up in recent years. This is a a six-point program of legislative reform in this area. First, as has virtually every summer study the medical education problem, we come out in favor of a capitation formula that's the basic device of medical school support. It's an amount paid per graduate. $6,000 was the amount that we finally arrived at and might add is probably half of the learning division of the American Association of Medical Colleges has uh, proposed. But it is a substantial increase over our present uh, formula funding for medical schools. We are trying hereby to switch over to a role where the federal government has a first dollar responsibility. Medical school knows in advance how much it's going to get from us. It has to buy from other sources of the state and private. It's last dollar support. No longer will be we be in the position we know for but being the people they look to for that last dollar financial distress assistance. And so we are scaling down the financial distress authority as the competition funding takes hold. There's a question of caution about graduate. The cost by graduate is, uh, is estimated at uh, between ten and twenty thousand dollars. That, that, I, don't, I don't believe that uh, you mean a full time that a graduate is a student is in the school for the cost of being sent to a medical school. Yeah, it's not counting capital costs. But hey, is that per year? Per year. Yeah, that's per year. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, then, but 
first job I had in school in the day, or four years I had in school in the day, and four or five years, or five years, and four or eight years. And what is proposed is a six hour per year, or six hours for the entire time. Six hours for the entire time. This is my life, six hour relationship with the boy and eight hours. Let's figure this out in the mind of the entire Check that for you. This is not the only money that's going in the school, so it would be fair to say that is that percentage figure is arriving. This is the bulk of the That's what this is talking yeah. about. Bob, there is, there, there is an ambiguity here, though. Uh, the 6000 per graduate might suggest that the grant of the school will be $6,000 times the number of people in the graduation fund. So that's correct. That's what it is. Well, then, that is $6,000 per student in the. Uh, that is correct. I'm sorry. No. The, uh, the idea was to choose a specific one to graduates so that uh, so we have built into a, a kind of performance or output criteria rather than it that go to the low model standards and fund these graduates. You're ready to have some time now? That's right. The conclusion was that there are enough physical and physical abilities in the teaching process to apply that to have very much. So at the same time, we are interested in trying to break out from other sources, for example, from uh, university health science centers, that you can going through those institutions and having them out of schools in the third and fourth years. And right now, you have excess capacity in the third and fourth year of education. You would like trying to fill those centers spots with this kind of advice to be able to that that kind of discussion. What kind of qualifications are made in school in this what, what What does the public private Yes, it's the standard uh, detail for this. The, the legislative definition exists in current law. It's very specific and is narrow so that it deals only with the group five odd medical schools. This goes also, I might add, to schools of dentistry and osteopathy. I understand you say that the excess of capacity in the medical schools is not much to do. So, in the sense that there is, there are, there is a tradition. The first and second years that it's leaving now to some of these spaces that are important because it's not supposed to be done with this program. So, you might have said, yes, historically, that's something that there are a number of two year medical schools, like the University of South Dakota, for instance, uh, that uh, have supplied in the senior year students to the established school. They come to these dropouts for whatever reason the community comes. No, comparable. And here's the whole idea of the public body. There's two year medical schools. There's two year medical schools that are post baccalaureate degree schools. And most of the region is still a public school, baccalaureate degree schools. And that's what we have to have as the medical schools we expand. There haven't been enough of the two year institutions to come along and make up this dance of the two year schools. But the next region does the two year school will get that. The two year school will get $1,500 per year. The, uh, the capitation formula has served in the incentives again built into it for increased production. You get the same amount, for example, when you run three years to the four years to this again to, to the recommendations of, of several groups and incentive for the region shortening. The AMA, by the way, supports this idea of the shortening. As it is by nature, an incentive for more graduates, the incentive to market costs come to mind as a state for graduate. But they also pay the problem two and three semesters in order to turn on faster, so you're, you're going to get the money sooner, right? Um, you go on a tri semester base as well as to a convention, yes. Uh, there is a second category as an existing law of special project grants for specific targeted purposes. Yeah. 
goes into expand our discussion on the amounts of total that are available here, targeting solely on the low income family. And as we have another area of higher education, we use the guarantee of all things. Generally, people without a guarantee of family income. So for areas that go to that, you have done. But that's it. That's it. You have found that there are certain conditions in our current programs that have limited effective use of medical education. And it has a long limit on it. It's fairly low. It has a number of years that you can draw on. There's no secondary market mechanism. Banks aren't coming up with products. In our higher education legislation, we, we have a mention to that. It's very good. And then lastly, a special advice loan forgiveness of these guaranteed loans where a long young minority student fails to complete medical education. And there are studies that show that, that this kind of person is unwilling to undertake that obligation, his own obligation, to better higher education, medical education. What we're trying to do here is to reduce the risk to him and that scare factor of coming in on all these programs to buy. He could be obligated to pay back a substantial loan, even though he's graduating from medical school and doesn't have a higher income. So, with that, we're saying, if you don't complete, we will forgive the loan. What if a guy goes to get a half kid and you're alone and you're living and you're sitting out on the half on the half you're on the half and you're on the half? So, there's going to have to be some way to remove that. I don't know if Dan would have got that bill of legislation or that regulation, but I think that's it. There have got to be ways for that abuse. Further on medical education, we are expanding funding in the Allied Health Personnel Training Area. But while there is a lot of expansion overall, it represents more of the shifting of funds within this category on the the type of allied health personnel that can expand a physician's uh, ability to, to serve patients, physician's assistants, the dentist's assistants, the nurse pediatric practitioner, and the nurse midwife. This, this category of person, as opposed to perhaps to a radiologist, or something like that. And there will be special emphasis on the team training of physicians by medical students with, with doctors. There is also loan forgiveness for physicians who practice in scarcity areas and who enter into uh, the primary care specialty to prescribe. I'm not sure that there are more problems and assets in this forgiveness business. I haven't watched in a few years since that university. We're not too optimistic about it. There is a loan forgiveness provision in current law. Yes, but really it's low for teachers, for doctors too, for nurses, and it, it hasn't done much. But uh, it is relatively low. For example, it's 10 years of good experience and average payback. They are like, you may discourage people from going in on their own part time or something part of the regular practice. Well, then finally, we are consolidating five construction grant programs in the area of medical education facility support, cutting back on the grant support as we have elsewhere, uh, and uh, trying to switch over to a loan guarantee and subsidy advice for construction support. I'd like to lead uh, this up a little bit because I know we're running over time. The form general proposal area is in the area of preventive health. Say it is a distinctive piece of the present proposal, not, not probably of the summary of the plan. And uh, it relates back to the partnership theme of trying to develop one of the elements of that partnership with the individual himself. He has got to be responsible for maintenance and health. Our proposals here is to buy and clean efforts to expand system health education programs. and to operate on the preventive medicine side, making certain high payoff areas that we can identify for the addition of special funds, both the biomedical research additions that the present 
already announced in cancer and in sickle cell anemia and in uh, operation of treatment areas, active prevention, aerial disease, which, which is even epidemic proportion around the United States, and secondly, the common cold incidence of infection, infection disease, alcoholism, and tobacco funding. These are typically areas, too, of uh, community health responsibility.
Corey has written it one step further. Uh, the estimate is that somewhere between 60 and 65 million people would be eligible for this kind of package. And the difference between that and the 80 million workforce or government employees and people who are covered by uh, paid insurance because they're unemployed or employed as low income and a number of other exempt categories. Uh, if you take 60 million people, here's another package which is priced at $400, which is my understanding of this package. You're talking about $24 billion a year of insurance. And the present expenditures by business, as far as we know, on health insurance are about $12 billion. So you're doubling the present cost, adding $12 billion a year uh, to health insurance costs. Uh, of the employees in business, of which one third for a time is paid by the employee, and two thirds by the employer, but ultimately three fourths of our business, or eight million dollars a year. Plus, uh, Mark, if you're just thinking about the, uh, well, I guess the 25% of the is that prescribed in that, and that's all we have to pay that, you know, that'll be blocking away, you know, like that. Uh, Feature right away, and so they'll pay the whole twelve million dollars. That's right, but, but if you don't change the tax system, then I mean, why are you you're just working against yourself in that? Well, anyway, I get the same result of approximately twelve billion dollars that it cost by taking the twenty-four percent of that no coverage, pricing that out, and making some assumptions as to those that have partial coverage, and the estimate is verified by one of the major insurance companies in this field. Now, the significance of the $12 million cost is that the large companies that have union negotiations pretty well have packages that conform to this. And what we're adding is approximately $12 billion for essentially small and medium-sized businesses that have inferior packages of health care or have no packages of health care. Uh, and I'd like to express very greatly the concern which is shared by the administrator of the Small Business Administration. And this is something that will be overwhelming for small business. Now we've talked about a number of alternatives in the discussion in the last week. One would be a package with less benefits, more deductibles, for example, uh, less benefits, uh, greater participation by the employee, and so forth. There are uh, plans which uh, one of the major companies comes up with that would be a presentable plan, uh, obviously less in benefits than this, that would come in terms of approximately $210 or $220 instead of $400. As a matter of fact, the low option for federal employees isn't anywhere near $400. It's uh, less than $300. $338. So we're going beyond that which we make available as a low option to federal employees when we talk about a $400 package. Now, so it would be possible, I believe, if we let the insurance companies come up with it, to develop a plan in the range of $210 or $220 so the employee would pay $70 and the employer $140. Uh, we can talk also about other special considerations for small business. Which uh, uh, does not appear in this plan. One would be to defer application to small business uh, employers of less than 50, for example, or uh, some other definition of small business, or to subsidize in part by the government the costs of small business, uh, or uh, even to have a, a substantial exclusion which provides essentially the major medical care but less of the uh, basic medical care uh, to the employee. I haven't been able to sell any of these options, and I want to express again the, uh, the fact that this is one hell of a, of a price to impose upon essentially the small business of the United States, even though it's the first bill of uh, 1973. And that we ought to think very seriously about what it does there and what it may do. Uh, in the field of uh, inflation as well. The real dilemma you have here is the entitlement system, insurance system that's developed, has developed uh, to a point where it now covers about 70 to 80 million Americans. And it does not include, by and large, deductibles and costs. And on the other hand, what we want to introduce uh, is a system that does do that. 
So uh, what we've got is something that is, will be very unattractive if we enforce uh, deductions to those 75 rating units that are now covered. And if we don't do that, uh, we are going down the road that, that we don't want to go, which is uh, to uh, provide a system that doesn't have adequate deterrent usage. And it's a damn dilemma. I don't want to answer it. Well, I, I think there are a number of dilemmas. I, I thought some that have been worked out. For, just for example, I have been able to sell this to PTW. For example, you develop a policy with a $500 exclusion per family. Which would mean that in, in case of all major illnesses, catastrophe, and so forth, they'd be insured from five hundred dollars up to fifty thousand dollars on an eighty one year old. Uh well you could you could you market and couldn't take market the way you think right now. That's not like the way to go. And it costs twenty million dollars families in America five hundred dollars more and they're not costing their time. Okay. Uh let's look at it another way. We're talking only about applying this discovery to employees who earn $5,000 or more. And the question is whether a large number of those people could not afford $500 worth of medical expenses a year. <coughs> Secondly, for those who couldn't, the insurance companies could offer a pool that would sell him some of that coverage between zero and $500. So they could buy it personally. Uh, now, that's only one way of doing this. The other companies have a great many ways of doing it. Their actuaries have told us that they can come up with a package which would be defensible in the range of $210 or $220. The $500 exclusion would get the cost down in the range of $180 or $170. Now, I use that only as an illustration to show that there are very many ways of doing this that would reduce the cost of business very materially. And I point out again, you're talking essentially about small business in this country. You're going to get them off the ground. I'd like to clarify that was one point you know, The national standards plan would apply to all employees without an income test, but you want to get a means test applied within the workforce. So it would cover a full time you know, worker below five thousand dollars, namely the working poor. Well that's that's a change then since that three because you were talking right. about it. Thirty-nine hundred dollars cut off, and then five thousand dollars cut off. That, the unemployment health insurance plan for unemployed persons uh, that's the cut off. But we always uh, felt that the so-called standards plan would cover all workers, even those who are poor. It would not cover the underemployed or those who are earning less than five thousand dollars under the government plan. It would not cover any full-time employee. Uh, I would uh, you go ahead and remark to say this when not on the air One of the problems here, of course, is that we're trying to solve the work disincentive not the present Medicaid program is created, whereby you've got, on the average, uh, Medicaid recipient receiving something like $150 worth of government health insurance. As soon as he becomes a full time employed person under the working board, he loses that. Uh, and he had adopted the idea here was to mandate something in the order of a $400 package so that this incentive notch would, would be dealt with to the extent that you cut back on the package to increase that, uh, that inhibition of getting off well the of the full time employment. How would you handle self employed people in this market? <coughs> in two ways. Self employed people should be covered in. Perhaps the Vice President would be well to go through the rest of the package to see how. I think we better uh, better do that because we haven't got a great amount of time left. Uh, how long will it take you to complete that? Five or six minutes. The Vice President's problem is it seems to me that substantial problems have been raised both by Jim and Mari and Joy. And they talk about this thing like going out there to the Congress day after tomorrow. If that's if I understand it correctly. I think these are problems that are you know, substantial ones. And uh, just kidding, I've said that we don't think we're going to run into a bus, so when it gets, it gets public. Well, I don't know what the president's decision on my head is, but uh, I think the president's made a basic decision on this. Am I right on that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, well, we're just as a candidate, uh, I'm sure that any, any concerns. Uh, like to hear is how much time is there for modification? We've been modifying this price credit right along and we 
you're still making some adjustments, I think, on the problem that Secretary Stanford is with regard to the, the premium value of this thing. Uh, there is some discrepancy still with regard to how much the plan uh, is really worth. Uh, we've got uh, four different actuaries working on it, and two are lined up on one side of the line, and two are lined up on the other side of the line. Uh, the ones we've been working with from the Department of Commerce or with the Department of Commerce cooperating with on a lower cost, uh, like $400. Uh, Secretary Richardson's actuaries have the $400 cost, and hopefully today those people are going to sit down and perhaps by some miracle they will arrive at a common figure. Uh, so that's just one problem we think we're coming to grips with. And I think that we're going to turn out to be a little bit closer to Secretary Stan's cost here. I think it is point out that what we did was to take the uh, federal government's low plan, which is $338, and add deductibles and co insurance to that, which would have the effect of reducing the cost of that plan. Uh, then on the other side, it would be paid up the uh, catastrophic or major risk insurance, which is a very low cost item once you get past $10,000. So that in some people, the differences appear to be. Uh, this plan by Secretary Stan's actuaries, as I got it anyway, the point of staff people yesterday is around $220 to $230 versus the uh, $400 cost that we have from uh, HDW's actuaries and the people that they work with us. One of the problems when we met with uh, Administrator Clevy last week, uh, he was talking about a 10 cent hour cost, which he was trying to accept. As we work this thing out, we come to the conclusion that if we're in the neighborhood of $220, $230 worth of ballpark, and I think that uh, there are going to be problems, but the trade offs here are very tricky. Uh, if you reduce the package too much more, we're going to get kicked in the head. We're not, uh, we're not doing enough for people. If, on the other hand, we leave it up too much, we'll get kicked in the head by small business. We're going to have this very practical dilemma that the Secretary wants to raise. Starting the people, the 20 million people who never had to contribute any. Has that been considered? Uh, well, I think it's considered in this plan. Uh, it just says that uh, there will be no reduction of anything that anybody has already. But if you want to accomplish what George has been talking about, that is that the you do mandate some distance. Why then you uh, wash out uh, or uh, the attractiveness of this plan to those 20 million people in their family? At the present time, in other words, practically all employees that are covered by group insurance plans have what they call first dollar measures. That is, there is no deductible of any significance. There is no real disincentive to use it. And this provides a disincentive for usage for those that aren't now so covered. But it will mean that the people that it provides this disincentive for uh, will be able to, through bargaining with their employer, to remove that disincentive. Last, the 20 million that now exist have removed it through bargains. Well, I think we felt that it would be difficult to change the situation that already exists. I think it's really impossible. Uh, and then, then, given that, and given the effects of, of what we're trying to do here, which is maybe build up the supply side as the first job that confronts us, we've got to come in grips with that. And we think that the program, as outlined here, is, is, is a sound one to do that. The other thing is that we will, because we're covering the people, be putting new people into the system. So, that, you know, there's an injustice, I agree, but the fact is that, that as we're building the supply side and feeding new people into the system, some of these products are going to and it's just as that is for the improper use until some of the supply side of the shoes begin to take effect, which is not going to be exactly in 1973 by any chance. Well, I think that's, that's another key point uh, on this whole thing. Some of the insurance companies say that plans will really be a fraud on many people because you can't provide $400 worth of benefits. And with the system we have, you won't be able to do it by 1973, so people will go to hospitals and doctors and not be able to get the care of their insurance board. The other thing, too, and just doing something for a defensive reason, is certainly no, uh, it is no way to justify anything, but the uh, we got to look at the same terms of the alternatives that we're confronted with. And uh, certainly it seems to me from everything you're reading, everything you hear, that uh, what is gaining a great deal of momentum is a complete takeover by the federal government and the 
nation's health system, uh, we've got to come up with something that uh, we think can get a job done, taking advantage of what already is there and reforming what doesn't work in the current system so that we don't eventually wind up with what is reported to be a $77 billion health bill uh, with the federal government stepping in and trying to uh, provide the nation's health system. We can't do anything else well. I can't possibly imagine what makes us think we can run the health system well. And as far as economic districts, I'm certainly starting uh, the tax bill for $77 billion has got to be astronomical. It's computed on the basis of about $1,000 per family. We're talking about a 3.5% increase in the Social Security tax. Not to mention what we'll have to do as far as raising people's income taxes to pay for the thing. So we're kind of confronted with all of these things, and it's a darn difficult problem. I think, uh, well, I'm sorry, I think we're going to talk about Finish the presentation because I think we're, we're having a slight of trip. Thank you. Thank you. We go on to the second and third elements of the plan, which is the federal responsibility now. We're proposing first a family health insurance plan to replace the family portion of the current Medicaid program. That is, 40% of our Medicaid expenditures that go to welfare families, uh, welfare mother, female head families were leaving the program for the ages line and disabled under Medicaid. <coughs> but putting the other portion under the program spaces, whereby first there would be national eligibility rules, the plan would cover all families uh, with children where the family uh, has no full time employed person in it, or where the family has self employed. And there is, uh, again, the welfare reform plan, and the sliding scale of premiums, so that you work out to an income ceiling, what we're tentatively discussing now, about uh, 3% of the poverty line. So it works out to $5,200. We're talking about a, a uh, uniform national benefit package, unlike the current Medicaid program, where you've got benefits varying from state to state, two states with no program at all. Uh, these, the package is modeled on the standard benefit plan that affects private insurance, except that for cost reasons there are certain limitations put into it, namely 30 days of hospitalization for each physician business per person, that kind of thing, the same covered services. And the premiums would cut in at $3,000 in family income with increasing premiums by family income up to the cutoff point of about dollars There would also be deductibles and co-insurance uh, on the same uh, order of magnitude as in the other plan, so that as someone moves off welfare into work, he's moving rather smoothly from, from a, uh, a federal plan into a private plan, which is structured the same way with the deductibles and co-insurance. This will have a fiscal relief effect on the states if they choose not to supplement the coverage with, uh, with their own state program. There are some services that are covered in some states now with the Medicaid for which there's federal matching that we would not be covering here, and so you can anticipate that many states like New York and California will use uh, the fiscal relief they would otherwise gain to, to enrich the states of medical tax. You'll see a, a conversion of candor there, a question mark as to what the total federal cost is because the construction program is still somewhat up for grabs. The cost is in the area of a billion dollars. It would have been a lot higher. Is that a question mark about the first year cost or is that the average cost of this after it gets fully in effect? So that's the first year cost, you see. Well, it's originally cost on it after it gets effect. <clears throat> well, it's originally designed, the program would be much more expensive, but by virtue of going to the requirements of employers, we have eliminated a great many people who would qualify under this program. So we reduced the cost down. And the question mark here, the short percentage, uh, we're still waiting for a decision as to what the income cutoff level would be. But the advantage of going this way is that we now have a restricted, limited residual federal program instead of one that was sort of open-ended and could be expanded 
for all the people up to 5,000 or 8,000 and so on, we have put a lid, if you will, on the federal programs. Um, and yeah, well, what is the year uh, cost after, uh, an annual cost after is fully effective? You make sure whatever is This is, this is, this is represents a fully effective cost. Uh, I understand that's a question you have to but well, it was calculated on the basis of all of them. Everybody's, everybody participated in the first year of the maximum line. Well, I'm going to go up with the point that we're The Medicare program would be made as the, as the other piece of federal responsibility, virtually intact, except uh, following a recommendation of the Legislative Social Security Advisory Council soon to emerge with proposing a consolidation of the Part A hospital and surgical uh, portion of Medicare with Part B outpatient uh, part into a single uh, program with the federal government picking up the current hopes for July 1, and as of July 1, $5.50 monthly premium that uh, Medicare enrollees now pay for their Part B out of hospital services. That would be picked up either from general revenues or trust funds. That question is still <coughs> standing open. Not the last thing I heard. And you can also learn what bargaining is. You have to stick to your bargaining. Passing that. That makeup of the uh, $5.60. Requirement in the 